they realize that their ideas can make a difference in the world and that people will listen to them. Mm -hmm. It's very heady. It's very fun to explore the world at that age. So you've been working with brands for your entire career to help them build out stories that captivate and engage their audiences, right? Um, so much is changing in how we communicate with others and with customers um, online and, mm -hmm. and in person, I suppose. How do you think the role of storytelling has shifted from, say, a couple decades ago all the way up to where we are now? Oh, Michael, that is so easy. Um, everybody in the world has a brand now. It didn't used to be that way. It used to be that when you told a story, it was usually about somebody else. But now the way the world works from e-commerce to personal branding, even to politics, is about having other people talk about you. So in a sense, if you don't control your own narrative, somebody else will. So to me, that's the biggest difference, which means we all have to own our stories for ourselves and for our businesses. Correct. Yeah. And we're always, you're always telling a story. You're always conveying something about who you are and what you believe, especially in this personal branding ecosystem, as you alluded to. Everything mm -hmm. you put out, every every post that you make on LinkedIn, it, um, it, 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 it says something about what you believe, what you stand for. And I think more than ever in this day and age, you sort of have to put your stake in the sand uh, and you have to stand for something. You know what I mean? I'm not going to disagree with that. I agree 110%. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what, that's what people care about. People want to mm -hmm. connect. Right. And when we share our opinions on things and when we share what, is meaningful for us. It allows others to feel the same and to express their stories as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it creates a safe space. You know, from a from a personal branding, from a marketing, from a sales perspective. You know, building your business online. One of the things that I find um, really interesting that's changed over the years is this: we used to we used to be able to control how people heard about us. You know, yeah. we we'd get an ad, they'd see another ad. They'd call in and we kind of knew what the best practice for handling customers was. We had three national daily, you know, th really three television networks. There was only one national daily newspaper, USA Today, and it didn't exist 30 years ago. And it, it ran for 15 years without any competition. Mm -hmm. Now we've got 5,000 plus media outlets, plus everybody's got their own podcast, yourself included. So Right. The way to think about that complex milieu of, of options is to make sure, like you said, that you do stand for something. And yeah. if you get that architecture nailed down, if that story becomes your core, then mm -hmm. everything that you put out can relate to it. And people will start to recognize that you are who you say you are, regardless mm -hmm. of the order in which they find that. They might see an article on LinkedIn, a mention on Instagram. Somebody might be talking about your brand or your business or your product or you at a party. And if you're rooted in your values and in the value you can create for others, people will recognize that pattern and they'll start to go, you know, this is somebody that I can trust. Yeah, 100%. Um, and I also think um, – maybe 15, 20 years ago, marketing and storytelling was sort of an afterthought or kind of like a, uh, I guess we have to do this. This has to be something that we do. But today, I believe you literally need to start with the story and because that's, that's the most critical core of who we are as brands and, and mm -hmm. as people. Um, when do you think brands should start should start thinking about integrating storytelling into what they do. You know, before you even have a brand is a really yeah. good time to start. If you already have one, you can start right away. Um, here, here's the deal. When you have a, um, when you have a really clear story, it brings focus to all of your efforts. It clarifies how you're going to deliver value for your customers. Most companies don't know how they do that. I have, 
yeah. well, dealt with at least a thousand customers in Story Miner's history of the last 20 something years. And it's rare for a client to know how they create value. They know how to say what they want to do. They yeah. know how to say what they want to make in terms of product or profit, but they really don't understand customer value. So you can start using a story right away. It can help you define your brand. It can help you shape your customer experiences. It can define your selling processes. It can help you sell better by servicing more. And I want to credit my friend Chuck Reeves for teaching me that you don't sell first, you serve first, and then you get the sale. You can also use stories for um, creating culture, um, earning buy-in, and for getting everybody into alignment. When should brands be using stories in business? <clears throat> Yeah. How about how do you, when do you use stories? You know, yeah. when can you use stories? Per, set up a situation about a business that somebody's in and then ask when can you use stories? And that'll be a good overview. So with, with brands that maybe they're just getting established or, you know, they're starting to build some awareness in the market, you know, I think 15, 20 years ago, storytelling and marketing may have been one of, the, one of those things where it was kind of just an afterthought, like, ah, oh, we need to do this, right? The most important thing is let's get our product done and then we'll give it yeah. to the marketing people and they can put a bow on it. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. But we've seen a reversal of that, you know, over the last decade and now the story comes first. So how important is it to be, to be thinking about storytelling up front? Yeah. You know what's going on right now? Let's talk about that before I answer your question. What's happening is people aren't just buying products yeah. and they're not being manipulated by stories. Consumers, customers, whether they're B2B or B2C, are getting everything together. They want they look at the experience from first hearing about your product from somebody else to hearing about it from you on your website, through your advertising and emails, to dealing with you and negotiating and contracting, to getting the product or service, using it creating value with it, and then finally sharing it with others. All of that is one experience to them. So the story becomes part of that experience, and it's actually part of what customers are buying. Okay, So when you're using your story, which is not just about who you are and the benefits and features of your product, we'll talk about that later, but that story is helping to shape expectations. It's letting people know what kind of a company you are, what you stand for. It can include how to use the product or what kind of benefits you can expect. It can hint at the kind of experience you're going to have and the benefits you're going to get. But most importantly, a really well-told story will let your customers know what the value to them will be in their words. It's yeah. not manufacturer or talking to customer. It's almost like customer who's successfully used the product, like a testimonial, talking to a customer who's about to use the same product or service. That's more the tone of the story. Does that make sense? A hundred percent. And I think, I think it's important for us to try to define what storytelling is and what it means today. Because when I first broke into the B2B industry eight years ago, you know, the idea of storytelling was, okay, let's write blog posts and put out white papers and put out social media posts to promote those things mm -hmm. that inherently are self-promotional, right? That's no longer an effective strategy today. And I'm not sure that it ever was, to be frank. What I'm talking <laughs> about is we're literally in a day and age where you're putting out micro content, reels, social media posts, where you are taking audiences through this anticipatory journey, a hero's journey of some sort, where you are literally telling a story, a short story about not yourself or your products, but something that you're observing out there in the marketplace or in the world, it doesn't even have to be closely related if you don't, you know, if you don't want it to be to what you do, as long as it adds value and captures attention. That's what I'm seeing in the market today. What are your thoughts on that, Mike? Yeah. You know, I'm seeing, I'm seeing a lot of that too. There are, there are many new kinds of storytelling that exist right now. Some of the most heinous and the worst ones are the ones that aren't founded in truth. We're getting lots of, I'll say, bad social media or free speech, you know, online in a lot of different countries. It's not just the United States that's suffering from polarization. Um, 
th this kind of inflammatory rhetoric is also storytelling, but yeah. it destroys more value than it creates. It's, it's awful. So, mm -hmm. um, it, it's just important to know that if you don't do your stories well, that they can end up on the dark side and so can your brand. Right. The, um, the thing about stories that I think is most important is that I'm going to tell this to you in two parts. We think that when we're telling a story, we're sharing everything that we know and we're 100% responsible for what we share. The reality is, according to the brain scientists, and don't ask me to quote which one, is about 30 or 40% of what we say is important, but about 60 or 70% of what people hear is more important. You don't get to tell a story unless both sides come together. And what's happening in the other person's or in your consumer's or your listener's or your user's brain is they are taking your words, your images, your videos, your story, and they're creating an experience with it. Mm -hmm. They are having an experience as they are consuming your story. So it's kind of like a coin where story and experience are two sides of the same piece of metal. So you're telling a story, the other person's having an experience. If you give them the right clues, expectations, facts, uh, um, if you give them the same, the right experiences, they will be able to share those with others. That's what we call going viral. You hear something really cool, you want to pass it on. If you have a great experience, like riding a roller coaster at, at Disney World or Six Flags, you want to tell your friends about it. The stuff that survives the telling and the retelling and the retelling, that's what your brand is. So if you can understand how people create experiences out of your stories and how they pass them along, you can provide better ideas in that initial content that'll help your brand grow and help your business be more profitable. Yeah. Is that, I, new, is that new for you or is that a, you kind of knew that all along? Right. No, that, that's a great, great question and a good point. I, I think what that made me think of is that quote that people will not remember what you said, but they will remember how you made them feel. And that's all that matters. And yeah. I think when people consume stories and when they share them, um, they're doing so because it has evoked something within them. And whether that's tied to, you know, an emotional response or a desire to be seen a certain way by associating with this story um, to up their status in some way by sharing mm -hmm. something. Um, it's about the subtle, maybe even subconscious underlying uh, response that we have when we consume those things. And so it's about constructing your stories in a way that is, is actually pushing the needle forth and um, capturing attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the things that I think is so exciting about the world that we live in right now is that we can do co-construction of stories with the people that we're hoping will respond to our messages. We live in a metaverse is almost here, uh, interactive time with all kinds of cool software that can give us um, data and statistics and opportunities to interact with each other in non-human and sometimes very effective ways. So when you think about co-creating a story, you don't have all of the details known up front. You don't target the emotion that you're trying to evoke in another person. You don't manipulate. Manipulative stories are, you know, the worst kind of sales stories. You think of the, uh, you know, the guy with a sloppy shirt and a used car dealer smoking a cigar and lying to customers, you know, the proverbial honest John car dealer. Uh, that's pretty manipulative stuff. You know, don't, I, I, I don't practice that. I, I won't do that kind of work anymore. It, not anymore, but ever. I've, I've never been attracted to that. And it's also very easy to do. It's too, it's too simple to just lie to people. The, the more rewarding work is to figure out how to have a conversation with people where both of you end up getting more of what you want. So if you're trying to tell a story for good, and if it's a sales story or a buy-in story or a political activism story, history, whatever it is, you need to have some things in place for your story to make sense. One of the first things that you need uh, in theater, they call it given circumstances. So imagine, and I got this from a friend of mine uh, who works in a theater, imagine you're a grown man, 35 years old, and you walk in front of 2,000 people in coats and ties, and you're wearing leotards. 
and you have to convince them that you're in Shakespeare's time. You have to be pretty bold to do that. Your given circumstances are some sets and a silly ass costume. And you're wearing this very dramatic makeup so it can be seen in the back of the theater. And you're supposed to convince them that you're in Shakespeare's time. That's pretty daunting. So when you know your given circumstances, it doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be the 1600s. Um, you make sure that you refer to the location, the time, the reality of where your prospect's living, where your listener, your reader is feeling and how they're feeling about themselves. So you've got to get that part right. The second thing that you need to know so that it comes through in your story is what is your own reason for being? We talked about that at the very beginning. It's about people getting clarity about why they're communicating with other people. You know, what is their purpose? What are they trying to achieve? Your reason for being is nothing more than what you do for others, how you deliver that service, and what others get from it. Right. Okay? So what's the outcome for them? You could weave in and how it makes them feel. Okay. Yeah. That's your reason for being. So you can be um, a storyteller. That could be your reason for being. Or you could help um, uh, PhD candidates present themselves to the professional wo world for the first time with killer resumes. That's a lot more focused. Okay? Depends on what you want to do. The other thing that you need to know are your principles. You can't have a really good story without knowing what your principles are. Now, you can tell an entertaining yarn or a silly joke, you know, but you can't really build a brand or um, a company around a story without principles. You need to know what you stand for. So one of the principles in my company, Story Miners, is that we won't do business with any company that by design harms others. Mm -hmm. So we won't do porn we won't do illegal substances. There are a whole bunch of things that we just don't do because they're not designed to help people. That's one of our principles. Um, the third thing you need to know is what kind of emotional value is your business and are you capable of creating? If you don't know that, your stories will be a little bit hollow or they'll, at the very best, they'll be a little bit random. When you know what emotions you can help people reach and achieve, um, you become more trusted. It was that feeling that you alluded to about three or four minutes ago when you were talking about making connections with folks. Yeah. If you say that you want to make people feel happy, well, okay, but that's not very specific. How about renewed? Mm. Okay. You know, or refreshed. That's like a Coca-Cola thing. The yeah. more specific you can get with the emotions, um, the easier it is to present them in your story and in the customer experience that you offer. And again, that story and customer experience are, you know, two sides of the same coin. All right. So before you even start building a story, you need to know something about your company and your customers given circumstances. That's when you can start to lay things out, but always anchoring them on these different principles and emotions and ideas of value creation. And when you reflect those over and over again, people will discover for themselves that your story is true because it's consistent and because they get a hand, which you've given them as a gift in building it for themselves. People love to figure things out. They love to figure out how do I live? Is this right for me? Will this person or will this company embarrass me or make me look good in front of my colleagues? All this stuff is going on in their head. So the co-creation of a story is way better than a one-way delivery. That was a long answer, but thanks for hanging in there. It, it, it sparked two important things that I want to, I want to mention. Um, number one, you want, to, uh, you want to let your story and you want to let the, the insight dictate the format. And I think too many uh, marketers and brands, they start with format and not with story. And mm -hmm. I've seen that mistake so many times where it's like, we need X amount of blogs and white papers and all of these different outputs, but it's detached from the strategy and certainly from the story at the core of who they are and what they do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have a passion project in the new age spiritual awakening arena where I just post insights. That's all I do. I just post 
insights and ideas that feel natural to me and that come to me. And sometimes people ask me like, how, how are you, where are these ideas coming from? And I say, when I'm, when I'm receiving the idea, I'm not thinking about the format. All I'm Mm -hmm. doing is focusing on crystallizing what I want to share. And then I go and I say, what's the best way to share this? Mm -hmm. Very cool. Very cool. That's one perspective. And I think the, uh, the other one that, that you, that you alluded to there too, was, uh, the importance of just authenticity and and also specificity with what you do with who you talk to and why you put out what you put out i'm really really big on on content mission statements which is basically just a guiding principle right to Mm -hmm. allow you to say here's the kind of content that i'm going to publish here's who i'm targeting with this content and it allows you to be it allows you to have a sort of framework with flexibility Mm -hmm. in what you do so that you're not just trying to talk to everybody with your story so you do need some some structure there that's that's aligned with you know with your goals but i wanted to ask you with all that being said how do you connect stories with strategy okay well let's um let me see if i can do that for you um you just brought up an i you just explained your method of work for um sharing inspiring stories right what if you were to reach out to some of the folks who've been inspired by your stories and mm-hmm. ask them to share what happened to them next? Yeah, exactly. See how that like double loops in? And yeah. then other audience members are going to see, oh, if I listen to this stuff, I might get here or here. I might grow as well. It's more evidence-based than it is just wondering or staring at your navel base. See what I mean? Right. Right. So that's an example of how you do it. You think about the end user and how you can create more value for them. So in this idea of you're creating this inspiration, here's what went through my my mind. I'm going to kind of slow it down. When you're at the late 20s, early 30s age, which is where I'm kind of pegging you right now. Am I close? All right. People who are, um, some people, a lot of people come into their own sense of power. They realize that their ideas can make a difference in the world and that people will listen to them. Mm -hmm. It's very heady. It's very fun to explore the world at that age. What happens over time is you run out of energy. You're you, you feel like this wellspring of knowledge and cool innovations and ideas, but after a while you kind of run out of that and you run out of the energy to make that stuff happen any longer. You need to find a new source of inspiration or switch channels a little bit. So I thought, you know, how long are you going to be able to go off and do that? And then I thought, all right, how can we put more juice into this? And how can we grow audience? And how can we make the content more accessible to more kinds of people who are at different stages in their life? You know, like there are certain people that you can communicate with, Michael, and there's others that will just prejudge you and they won't listen to you. Yes. But there are a number of folks who might listen to you and then will share with their audiences. Like maybe there's a a young woman in Ghana that you're having a fabulous effect on. Her peers would never look you up, but they would listen to her. Right. Okay. So that kind of brings more folks back in. So to do that, you have to include other people, not just in the experience of the story that you shared with them, but in their own sharing experience. So if they're not a YouTuber or a a Twitcher or, you know, somebody else that likes to share publicly, you can give them a space on your platform and show them how to do that more easily. So you can kind of create this recursive loop where you go back and your audience hears from people who have applied your insights to their own advantage. Exactly. Okay. So all that went through my head in just a split second um, as a way to kind of uh, apply this idea of story the way you asked. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> yes, I'm a big fan of not just user-generated content. I think everybody should be thinking about how they can weave that in. Um, introducing feedback loops into your storytelling processes. Social media is a great tool to do that. Obviously, you know you can put up a literal story on your Instagram mm-hmm. page with stickers and um, those engagement tools where people can respond. And you want to make sure that when they do, that you're not just letting those responses sit idle. Like you, mm-hmm. you want. You want to respond to them. You want to leverage them in content and to inform the stories that you tell in the future, right? Um, 
I'm a big fan of takeovers, like giving your audience access to your channels, right? Mm -hmm. In certain capacities to allow them to share their stories. That's a great point that you were making. Um, your question was about story as strategy. Do you want to head back there? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So I used story as a strategy for you, but let's talk about what that means. Um, whether you're starting off with a blank sheet of paper or you've got an established company and you realize that with all the changes in the world, you need to make a strategic shift and go in a different direction. Yeah. One of the things that stories can do that spreadsheets and PowerPoint presentations can't do is bring emotion and creativity and imagination to the table. Let me tell you a story. See how all of a sudden your brain just like shifted you yeah. want to hear a story. What's going to happen to this other person? Tell me about it. I'm listening. You were wired for that ever since you were a kid. And some people believe that as a, as a species, humans have been wired for story for 100,000 plus years. Because for the longest time, that was the only way that we could pass down what we knew or our preferences or find the big buffalo to kill or whatever the, you know, the stories are. I wasn't alive back then. I think it would be fascinating. But I'd probably die within a day. <laughs> I don't know if I'd be too street smart in the Cro-Magnon era. Anyway, so what stories can do is they engage people in a very different way than traditional strategy tools like budgets and spreadsheets. Right. When you tell somebody a story, they will suspend their disbelief mm -hmm. for a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. That means that instead of approaching with resistance, like we've all been trained to do because we get like five or 10,000 messages a day. Those are real numbers five or 10,000 a day clamoring for our attention. It right. might be more than that for people who spend more time on social media, but it's, it's just incredible to think that you have to cut through all of that stuff. So we've all trained ourselves to say, no, no, not for me, not for me, not for me. Oh, I'll pay attention to that. And then you go back to saying, no, we say no so many times it's become instinctual for us. Yes. When you can suspend that disbelief, you can let a few little, neurons fire in your listener's brain and they can start to follow along with you but what you have to do is be really interesting so the way to be interesting like you said before is to be authentic and specific and you want to share your ideas about the future and the best way to do that in many cases not every case is not to tell people what they have to do to change and give them a step-by-step -step flow chart or a you know project plan to go forward you move into the future and you start telling the story as if you were already in the future. And then you look back at today and you say, wow, this was so cool. I got to go from here to here. And I learned this along the way. And I got to work with these cool new people. And you look at it as if it's a, I can't speak French, but a fait accompli, a done deal. And you start painting the picture of the future replete. But to do that, you as the storyteller have to think through what's that future going to be like? You can't just say, oh, it's going to be great. Trust me, that's not enough. You right. have to say, oh, your, I don't know, your, uh, your paycheck's going to come on your app and your savings is going to be automatic mm -hmm. and you're going to have to spend less time paying bills and blah, blah, blah. I'm imagining like an ePay kind of a solution. You have to tell people what their life is going to be like and let them feel what the advantages are. So I've already said, I don't have to go to the bank to make a deposit. My savings are automatically, you know, tithed or taken from my check. So I know I'm going to be well off financially and I don't have to do this and that, and that's going to give me all that free time. So what would you like to do with it? Oh, well, I could do this, that, and the other. That's a whole different mindset than, look, we're not going to let you go to the bank anymore. You're going to have to fill out all this stuff online and do things this way. And if 87,000, you see, it's already kind of boring and it's not mm -hmm. personally related. So these, the, the highest and best use for me of a story for strategy is to use a future story and to put your listeners in a, in a vivid experience of the future that relates to them and sh gives them the reason why they yeah. would want to live in that future. Then you talk about the steps to get there. I love that future projection future projection based on data research and what you already know about where things are moving. Can position. And, and, and creativity. Um, I'm very uninspired. I'm going to take a different tact here. Michael, I am very uninspired by many of the data up stories that I've heard. Sure. Oh, you know, so many of our users are using this feature. So this is what we're going to do in the future. Yeah. 
not always correct. Yeah. Not always. We, so many things are changing in the world right now. And data and emotion are so far separated from each other. Mm-hmm. Creativity and spreadsheets are so far separated from each other. If yeah. you're measuring this, you can't see this. Number, we only can measure what you, you can only like learn what you measure, so to speak. That's not true. But if you're trained that way, something that you can't measure, like an emotional response or someone's personal preference or whimsy or fun, those things you can't represent in a spreadsheet. So you miss out on the opportunity to make things better. Yeah. Can I give you an example? Yep. I just stumbled across this in a little city in France. I wasn't there. I, I read, excuse me, a little city in Italy. I put it in a presentation the other day. So in Italy, the buildings are rather old and they're very big. You don't get to change the size of your streets. You know, they're fixed. And they started when we had carriages. So even though now we have cars, they park them in an angle on either side to try to squeeze more in. So the garbage truck is going down the street and they have to remove all the cars. So there's these no parking signs on one side and the truck goes down and picks up all the bins and dumps the garbage. And then on another day, people have to like not park on the other side of the street and the garbage truck comes back. So you've got double people having to move their cars and park them somewhere else. You've got double the miles double the pollution in the air and double the noise pollution, plus all the inconvenience and on and on. So somebody comes up with a new way to do garbage and it's just so simple. Mm. Inside of the cab, there is a joystick and the big arm that picks up the garbage cans can go to one side. And by virtue of having a camera there, it can also go to the other side. So now they run the garbage trucks one time and you don't have to move your cars because the arms can pick up over the cars and put it in the back. Mm -hmm. So that solution, I I haven't interviewed the company, but I imagine it came about from looking at the given circumstances and the value for others. So the value for others is you don't have to repark your car. The truck only comes by once. You don't even have to move your cars. It's less noisy. It can operate 24 by seven. It only takes one driver, not a driver and a pickup person or two. And it's more efficient. So that's an example of using, you know, creativity and others' problems to create more value for everybody. And to me, that's where future stories can really make a difference. They can give you a clean picture in words or actually in pictures and videos and reenactments of what life could be like in the future and then let people decide what they want to do. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. It's almost like the, the bigger problem that you solve, the better stories you can tell. Or the more defined you are on what problem you fix for others, the more stories you can tell around that. So Yeah. And, you know, you use the phrase, the more stories you can tell around that. One of the um, techniques I'd like to share with the listeners to your podcast is a round table. So imagine you've got a problem and everybody's seated around the table, just like Knights of the Round Table. Well, Your story can look at the CEO's point of view or the OSHA, you know, occupational safety and hazard point of view or marketing or operations or security and theft, all these different views. So if you share the storytelling and you talk about the same situation from different people's perspectives, Mm -hmm. it gives rise to the things that are most important to them. Mm -hmm. You You can have a great idea, but the risk management people say, Oh my God, you can't be touching patients like that. That's just like, that's lawsuit city, you know? But if you look at it from a different perspective where the patients ask for help because they know that a certain kind of service is available, that's perfectly okay. So there's value in looking at the same situation from these different lenses and expanding your storytelling to not just be from your own mind, but to be from the collective's experience is a really cool technique to get Um, authentic and specific. And I want to add one more thought, Michael. All these things that we're talking about with story require you to do a lot of work. You can't just like make them up and say them. It's not like a bedtime story for a kid or a Mm -hmm. bad joke, you know, about liquor and leprechauns or something like that. It's got to be about a detailed and poignant vision of the future, one that's vivid, one that really does create value for others. So you have to spend some time Thinking that through and thinking through 
you know, how you want to share a story about it because you are creating an experience for other people. That's that first impression. And if yeah. you use story well to create that first impression, you're good. Just go back to the story I mentioned about the garbage truck. Think about how I set it up. Problem first, double time, double pollution, double blah, blah, blah. And then I used my hands to kind of draw a picture, you know, on the podcast of what that was like. That was shaping the story from different points of view. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you mentioned technique, right? And I want to ask you, I want to make sure that we get to technique and tactic uh, mm -hmm. a little bit in the show, right? Because we talked about kind of starting from the top down with your strategy, right? And the story you want to tell, but what are some of those methodologies in terms of actually getting your message in front of people that you are seeing really working right now, whether that's on social, maybe it's email, website. Wow. Um, I am not an expert on that. And right now I am terribly frustrated with marketing because I think it is fundamentally broken. It feels a little bit like the healthcare system in the United States to me, where the insurers in the middle get fat, dumb, and happy. And the practitioners, the doctors are making less and the patients are paying more. Marketing is very similar to that. There's too much bloat in the middle. There are too many people trying to collect a nickel for getting you in front of the right people. And there's too much self-service, meaning you have to experiment at high cost to figure out what works for you. And as soon as you do, the algorithms and the market behaviors change or the way Google or Facebook or whomever does their uh, advertising tiers changes and you have to kind of redo things. You're at the whim of your marketers. It should be the other way around. All right, so now that I've had a second to vent, um, the things that I think are the most interesting right now that are doable by average folks, not by super brands, not by people with, you know, $10 million a month agencies on retainer, yeah. um, is to first be consistent. So know your lane, stay in your lane. If you're B2B professional services, you're on LinkedIn. If you want to experiment with selling clothes for avatars, you better be in Horizon Worlds or something similar to that. You've got to be in the right place where transactions can happen. So a transaction includes sharing story, people getting to know you, making a decision, moving to purchase. What's the smallest landscape you need to get that done? You don't want to be doing 55 different social media channels and sustaining all of that when none of them even have a buy button or the equivalent of a buy button. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Um, in the, I, I do a lot of professional speaking and people don't just like drop a quarter in a slot and then you start performing on screen. It, it, it requires a conversation and getting to know the goals of the client and those kinds of things. But making it easy for them to shortlist you is the way it works in the speaking business. And it also relies a lot on referrals. So besides the notion of um, knowing your lane, consistency is important. Having your reason for being, your emotions, your principles, you know, your, your customer experience laid out in a journey. Yeah. Keeping, know, knowing that makes all of your other efforts, whatever they are, a lot more successful and you can be consistent. The one thing that I see that's helping more and more brands to become successful is luck. When you think about some of the hot new music stars, somebody at Spotify just picked them. Yeah. When I, when I experimented with um, LinkedIn's uh, posting software, you know, they let you do posts early on. I went from like 100 to 6,000 subscribers in two days. That's because I got lucky and they picked me. That's not a strategy, but yeah. it kind of goes to prove that, you know, a lot of hard work, yeah. um, you know, it might get your numbers up, but is it the right people? I'm not seeing, I'm not trying to make everybody feel terrible, but I'm not seeing a lot of, um, you know, pick your goal, get there kind of success. It's very ramshackle. So back to that notion that marketing is broken, you know, you should be able to work your way toward a goal. You know, you should be able to buy your way to a goal which is what, you know, advertisers with deeper pockets can do. Right. right. So what are you seeing? Because that was a pretty negative view here. I hope everyone's like not crying as they're listening to this. What do you think? I think, no, I think that's all great. 
I think we're in the midst of this micro content movement. I mentioned it earlier. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> if you don't understand the, not just the value of but how to create bite-sized, short, snappy content that is, is different from what everybody else is doing, then you're going to fall behind. And I think the real, the, the real opportunity, um, especially for B2B brands, right. Mm -hmm. Is to be where the audiences are. So LinkedIn, YouTube, maybe Twitter, um, but also not to X out Instagram or, or TikTok necessarily just because they're newer and they're, they, they tend to have a younger, you know, more, more consumer oriented audience, mm -hmm. but it's really being, being willing to dive into some of these new uh, techniques and tactics and to see what works and to see what doesn't work and to take your strategy and to take what you had been doing on the blog or on the webinars or on, on social before and to put it into this new framework because in my view we really don't have a choice and it's just a matter of having to adapt and marketers have been adapting forever so now we just have to be willing to do that in yeah. this, this new age so let me let me put a little structure to that um yeah. i've heard that that line of thinking and belief from a number of folks in the recent past and i think i said the same thing when i talked about how marketing is broken you know, you have to try a whole bunch of things and find out what works. There is no method. That's kind of an excuse for failure, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is okay. I mean, if you're going to try something new, you have to be willing to fail. I mean, that, that makes a lot of sense. But let's let's bring it back to storytelling for a second. So mm -hmm. one of the things that you can do as you, as you find these little niches of content that you want to start to share is to serialize your story. You're not old enough to remember, and neither am I, what happened at movie theaters years and years ago where you'd pay a dime to go watch a feature movie like a Western or something like that. But before that, there'd be a few little shorts. Disney started to bring back some of its cartoons, and it's playing them before features. There also used to be newsreels, some of which were sponsored by the government, um, others you know, by your local you know, forestry service with Smokey the Bear. It was the only kind of like mass communication out there. So these little like commercialettes were, were put in there. And what was interesting about a number of them is they told a little bit of the story this week, a little bit the next week, and a little bit the next week. So breaking content up into really small bits, it sounds like really easy to do, but it makes a lot more sense if you can kind of tie a whole bunch of them together in a string so that it's easy for people to recognize that they're in the beginning, the middle, or the end of a story. So if you think about putting your content out as a larger story arc, but doing it in pieces, it, I believe, will get you further faster than a bunch of randomness because that confuses people about who you are and what you are. The reason I believe this is that we used to be able to be in control in the order in which people saw our messages. And we still are with email unless their firewall hits or they don't open one or they trash it or they don't have time. But, you know, let's take a record, for example, an old fashioned record. It would play the first song then the second then the third. You didn't get to pick the order unless you got up to move the stylus over to another song and back again. Yeah. The Walkman comes out, the iPod comes out, you know, now you're in control of your music. Mm -hmm. Same thing's true with ads. People will wander. That's what they do. Everyone's vying for attention, not just you, not just the audience, but everybody is trying to get them to, to go like this, like a little squirrel or a gerbil and jump to their, to their stuff. So yeah. you've got to make sure that as people see one piece of your content, it makes sense when they see the next part and the next part. Mm -hmm. If you engage them along the lines of good storytelling, they're going to be on the lookout for your next piece of content but it has to answer the prior one and kind of set some anticipation and excitement up for what comes after that. So knowing what your audience wants, not just in terms of your product and its benefits, but the kind of experience they would like to have, the situation they're in, the emotions that they value most, that's all the creative stuff. You're not gonna find that in spreadsheets. That's how I believe you can architect a storyline that really makes it through and yeah. starts to connect with people. At the end of the day, old marketing, new marketing, storytelling, social media, whatever it is, it's a meaningful connection that people make. 
that teaches them something, that shows them how to live, and that makes them feel a little bit more like themselves, if that makes sense. Um, those are the things that are universal and that are very, very attractive to people, regardless of what's at the end of the message, the pleasure of a song, a new sale, uh, buying a new house, getting instruction for kids, learning how to do a handyman task. It's all pretty much the same. People are looking for something that satisfies them and makes them feel a bit more complete. So stories, a great solution for getting there. Can I, can I piggyback off of that? Of quickly? course. So I think I don't want to imply that long form is gone or is dead. I think it's very much more alive than ever. I just think it's changing in terms of the, the format that we take to effectively create that impact with our audience. And you made such, such a great point. I'm glad you brought that up. I'm seeing this move toward sort of like series-based content, whether it's podcast, YouTube episodes, that as you mentioned, it sets the stage for what's to come next. And so just throwing out random things and hoping that they catch is not a good strategy, mm -hmm. right? It has to be cohesive. And one way that I'm seeing marketers do that is with series-based or chapter-based content, even within a single piece of content, you're breaking it up into chapters. Like you can do that on YouTube. You can earmark certain parts of the video, mm -hmm. and you can chapter one, chapter two, and so on. So you can do yeah, that. Yeah. That makes sense. Mediums. Yep. I um, love that. Love that. Yeah. And you know, as we as we kind of wrap up the conversation here, Mike, one, one question I wanted to make sure that I ask you, and it's going to be a loaded one. Um, <laughs> I know you've worked with some incredible brands. You know, you've worked with McDonald's, IBM, other large and small companies. What has kind of been, I guess the, I hesitate to say the biggest takeaway, but one of the things that pops out to you um, in terms of your learning across your career when it comes to storytelling? I would say that um, stories and their, well, for right now for me, it's that the best way to express this future strategy of a firm is through a story. Yeah. You can have all the spreadsheets and project plans and PowerPoint decks that you want, but a good story that captures the feelings of the future, the outcomes that are, have been realized from that future perspective and bringing those home to people today, that's the most effective way to get alignment and buy-in between all the different parts of a large brand, including its partners. It lets everybody have a voice. And the story construction process starts the um, collaborative discussions even before you share that story. It's not mm. like you can just work away in a little lab and then say, ta-da, here's my story, and everybody is instantly on board. It doesn't work that way. If you're a dictator and you threaten to kill people, yes, that's the way things work, but right. not in our world. So uh, start with a story, share it with a group of people, have them start to make it better. And then that group shares it with another group and you spawn another discussion group and so on. You get more people engaged in shaping the story to be all that it can be. And the magic moment happens when people go, oh, I don't have to fight against this. I can bring everything I know and make this better. There's a shift. It's almost palpable when the attention turns away from politics and what I want to get out of it in my position at XYZ company to, oh, we're doing this to create value for others. Let me see how I can make that happen better. And all those conversations about balancing resources and accountabilities and responsibilities, they start to take on a singular goal. And stories help you focus on what those goals are in a way that benefits everybody. I think good storytellers are good designers and good designers are good strategists. And good strategists know that it's not about getting one positive outcome, it's about getting a bunch of them. So you look at all your stakeholders and you see how can everybody get more of what they want? And that's what a good story does. It's back to the garbage collection example, less disruption for the homeowners, less noise, less miles on the truck and maintenance costs, less air pollution. Uh, trucks can work at night, you know, electric and quiet. That just worked for everybody. It was a really smart one. So that was a good story. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, Mike, where, uh, where can people go to connect with you and to learn more about Story Miners? Sure. Well, um, here's my uh, email address, mike at storyminers.com. Yeah. And my telephone number in the Atlanta area, 404 
229-5809. And um, there you go. Or just Google Mike Wittenstein if you can remember how to spell it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we'll have all those links in the description as well so you guys can can uh, connect with Mike and learn more. Well, Michael, I'm, I'm really encouraged by the conversation. You have um, such a mind for story. You're asking amazing questions. You're really curating the content well for your audience. And it's just, it, it's great to see fresh minds um, working on some of today's problems and opportunities. So kudos. I appreciate that. And thank you so much for joining me. What a great conversation. All right. Be well. Thank you.